This episode of the show is brought to you by listeners like you, who with a small contribution help to fund the podcast. Go to patreon.com forward slash WW2 podcast for details on how you can help support the show. Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In this episode, we'll be looking at the attempts to disrupt and destroy the Germans' access to heavy water, which was essential for their atomic research. If that sounds familiar, it could be because you've seen the film The Heroes of Telemark or watched one of the many documentaries on the operations against the heavy water plant at Vermog. But very few of these documentaries will have looked at the subject as closely as Neil Bascom's new book, Winter Fortress, painstakingly researched with access to the diaries of some of the men involved, it sheds light on a remarkable series of operations in Norway. Neil, thank you for joining me. Um, we need to start with, with heavy water to understand why the Allies were so keen to sabotage the German efforts in, in making it. Why, why was it important? Well, heavy water is... You know, I don't, I don't necessarily need to go into the, to the, the deep physics of it, but essentially hydrogen has uh, a single proton and, and a single electron, and heavy hydrogen um, has a neutron, actually, in the nucleus as well, um, which increases the weight, which is why we call it heavy hydrogen. Another name for that is deuterium, D2O, which is heavy water. And the amount of, of uh, heavy water in, in, in regular water is almost imperceptible. It's, it's one molecule of uh, heavy water for every 41 million molecules of, of regular water. So it's very rare in nature, and it's very hard to isolate and produce in any quantity. And the reason that heavy water is important in nuclear research and in and, and the construction of potentially an atomic bomb is it acts as a moderator. What that means is in a nuclear reaction, uh, in a potential chain reaction, it fosters and helps promote the fission of uranium atoms. And it does that in a very complicated way. It, it doesn't absorb uh, flinging around neutrons as, as, as much as regular water or other um, properties. The Norwegians have it. It's not a, a place you would uh, associate necessarily with uh, rampant nuclear development or atomic development. Why, why do the Nor Norwegians have uh, such a big heavy water plant? I say big, we're not, they're, they're not producing a lot, are they? No, it's, you know, the quantities you're still talking about are, are in, the, in the kilograms per day, very small amounts. Yes, it is uh, strange to think of Norway as the, the epicenter of, of this important ingredient in atomic research, and particularly the place where Vermuk existed, which is 100 miles west of Oslo in, in the wilds of Norway. But the reason is, is because they had a lot of water there, and they had a hydroelectric plant. And the production of heavy water requires a lot of water and a lot of power to uh, isolate that heavy water from regular water. And there was a, a plant that existed there that was a hydrogen factory that helped produce uh, fertilizers. And there was a scientist named Leif Tronstadt who in the early 30s, when heavy water was discovered by an American uh, scientist, uh, Leif Tronstadt said, well, there might be a lot of opportunity here. Uh, we have a lot of power and we have a lot of water. We could produce heavy water. And so he and a, and a colleague went about inventing a process that would do that. And they created what was the single supply source of heavy water in all the world. Did the Germans, when they took control of Norway in um, 1940, did they, how high on that was on, was the plant on their list of, uh, was a shopping list when they when when they took Norway in 1939, early 1940. Uh, the German scientists, uh, under an individual named uh, Dr. Kurt Diebner, uh, they were very interested in heavy water at Vermuk, and they had ordered uh, a pretty big quantity of it. And the Norse Kidro, which owned the plant, said, "You know, what do you want it for?" And and essentially, no. 
when the Germans evaded, one of the first things they did was uh, secure the plant and the area around the plant in order for supplies to now be sent to Germany. And how advanced was the German uh, atomic program at this time? Well, the German atomic bomb program in, in 1940, 1941, um, even into 1942, was essentially where the Allies uh, program was. There was a lot of uh, basic research being conducted. There was a lot of aggregation of material and supplies and, and, and research institutes. And they were in the process of figuring out how to go about producing an atomic bomb and and putting sort of everything in place for, for that to happen. And heavy water was one of the chief ingredients of their atomic research in order to create a self-sustaining uh, nuclear reactor, uh, which they then hoped to produce plutonium from, which was the ingredient they needed to produce uh, uh, an explosive. So the Allies were aware of, uh, obviously, of the German... Of, of the control of the plant because no doubt they would have been getting their heavy water from the same source before before the fall of Norway. What was their initial reaction? I mean, did they have good intelligence on what, what the Germans were uh, doing in Norway uh, around the plant and, and their demands on the plant? They did. They had the best intelligence they possibly could have. Uh, and this is one of the parts of the story that's in the book that that I loved, uh, this individual that I mentioned before, uh, Leif Tronstadt, the scientist who actually created Vermont. He was uh, a Norwegian scientist. He was in his mid-30s. He was a sort of rising star. Uh, he was a professor in Trondheim. And as soon as the Germans uh, occupied Norway, he essentially started a spy network, uh, providing the Allies information on German interest in various parts of the Norwegian uh, economic machine. And one of those, of course, was heavy water. So the Allies knew very early on that the Germans were ramping up production at the plant. And Tronstadt conveyed all this information to the Allies. And as soon as the Germans and the Gestapo figured out that Tronstadt was supplying information and spying, Tronstadt uh, escaped the country, uh, arrived into England, and began uh, providing intelligence uh, directly to the Allies in the next office, as it were. There was quite a number of uh, Norwegian exiles um, in England, wasn't there, working for SOE, which is the British Overseas Intelligence uh, Service during the war. Um, That in itself is quite a good story. I mean, how did did so many of them escape? There were uh, hundreds uh, who were essentially... uh, came over uh, to England, joined the particular division of uh, ASOE, the company Linga. And there were many others who es- escaped Norway and, and just joined the, the army, the exiled uh, Norwegian army there. But they, get, they got there any way they could. Some took uh, boats, uh, some managed to get flights, uh, escaped to uh, cross over to Sweden and, and take flights over to England. Others took round the globe uh, journeys that took half a year or more uh, to reach English shores to to fight for the freedom of of Norway. So there were quite a few patriots who were escaping to England, and uh, the select of the select joined uh, this SOE uh, organization, uh, in particular uh, Company Ling. I I was quite surprised. I hadn't quite realized. I mean, I don't know why I hadn't realized, but it's relatively open traffic between England and Sweden. I mean, I know Sweden was um, neutral, so why shouldn't there be? But I uh, hadn't quite realised it was uh, the, the, it was still a line, a line of communication that was it was left open for people uh, to come and go, which was a, obviously a link to, an easy link to Europe. No, Sweden was, was essential, uh, not only as a transportation link, but as an intelligence link. So the intelligence that Leif Tronstadt, for instance, was conveying, uh, was sometimes sent by wireless uh, radio, but other times was uh, was smuggled over the border to Sweden and put in a diplomatic pouch and, and delivered over to to England. And in fact, uh, Life Johnstad himself uh, was one of those individuals who took a flight uh, from Sweden to England. So they, they decide that uh, the uh, plant at Vermok is a uh, high priority um, uh, target. But it's a difficult target. I mean, I wonder if you could uh, you know, explain to us why that's a difficult target. Well, Vermeck is located in the Norwegian wilds in a, in a very deep valley 
that uh, is right on the edge of a high mountain plateau called the Hardanga Vida. And this is a place that is uh, uninhabitable, essentially. I mean, it is a frozen wilderness. The, the legend goes that it, it gets so cold so fast that uh, flames freeze in the fire. And that is where this plant was located. It was located on the edge of a precipice, on the edge of a cliffside that had a single road that reached it across a, a deep ravine. And it was, as the title of my book uh, says, a winter fortress. Mm. And in order to, to reach it, uh, you had to be um, someone who could both cross-country ski, uh, survive in the wild, and execute a military operation that uh, was uh, made even more difficult because of the intense German presence, uh, security presence at the plant. They, they sort of came up with various options. What, what alternatives do they have to take them out? I mean, obviously bombing seems to be the obvious one. Uh, why was that not top, necessarily top of the list? So very early, this was in, in early 1942, the Americans, the British, they said, we need to hit them up. Uh, we need to get rid of it. The Allies cannot stand uh, the Germans uh, developing a bomb. So they came up with, with different scenarios. But the chief scenario was, let's just bomb it. Let's just bomb it from the air. But what you have to understand is this, the valley that Vermouk is located in is very deep. The sun very rarely shines there. It's a very small target. So it's a daytime uh, bombing operation. And uh, further difficulty is the fact that Vermouk is hundreds of thousands of pounds of steel and stone. And the heavy water plant is the most key aspect of it is in the basement. So even if you bomb it, uh, you're very unlikely going to hit the most important part of the plant. And furthermore, there's going to be a great deal of civilian casualties. And again, this is Norway, this isn't Germany, so there has to be some consideration for collateral damage. And so Live Tronstadt said, no, under no circumstances uh, should we bomb this plant. A, you're not going to hit it. B, you're going to potentially kill a lot of civilians. So they said, okay, so what are our other options? And the other options are a combined operations force, you know, a fairly large force of maybe 50, maybe 200 men, British soldiers, or as Leif Tronstad wanted, he wanted to send a force of a small force of Norwegians who knew the terrain, knew how to navigate it. And at the end of the day, uh, the British decided to go with initially two teams of, of Royal Engineers, uh, sappers, to parachute or go in by glider uh, and hit the plant. And this was Operation Freshman, a glider-borne operation, which is, again, it, so it's combined operations, which is you know kind of a, a newly put together uh, team with glider-borne uh, operations, which I'm not sure the British had ever done before, but obviously the Germans had seen success in... Uh, in the Blitzkrieg of 1940. <laughs> Did it have any hope? Well, it was called Operation Freshman because it, the glider-borne troops had never before been used by the British. So it was the initial attempt at, at such. I always thought, well, this is, this is absolute madness, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, glider-borne, knowing the terrain, knowing the mountains, uh, knowing the cold, knowing that these people have to be dropped at night, it seems insane. But it was fairly rigorously uh, analyzed in document after document. What is the best way to bring these people in? The thoughts of, of parachuting them in got, got discounted because the, the forces would be scattered everywhere and there was the potential for them to be spotted. They couldn't land uh, a plane there uh, because the lakes at that time would not have been frozen and there would almost be little way to get out. So Gliderborn became the, the best of many bad options. If weather would have held, the clouds wouldn't have come down, if the, the uh, radio beacons that were guiding them in would have worked uh, properly, there was a chance that it would have gone off. At least one of the two gliders would have made it, and the Norwegians on the ground who were waiting to lead them to the plant uh, the four-man team that would lead them to the plant, would have done it. The Norwegians, in time, 
you know, moving forward, they thought if, if these circumstances would have come together, they, they would have been successful. But that's not how life operates all the time, and particularly in war. And disaster uh, followed disaster, and uh, all of these royal engineers died. They had success getting a team on the Norwegians on the ground, hadn't they? Which was that Grouse. Yes, the the four man uh, team uh, Grouse. So that landed that... in October of 1942, a month in advance of Operation Freshman. So that had gone well. That that lays the ground for the uh, gliders. I mean, where? I mean, what happened on the night that they came in? So on the night they came in, there was there was uh, two two Halifax planes uh, towing the gliders. I just imagine, and, and, and I write this in the book, you know, what it would have been like to cross the North Sea in, in what many call the wooden coffin, uh, these gliders, which uh, was like being on the, on the back of a Bronco, you know, tossed back and forth, uh, held out by only, you know, the straps. But they managed to cross the North Sea, but the weather worsened. The cloud cover came down. This was at night. They couldn't spot locate uh, where to drop because, to be perfectly honest, uh, this plateau, uh, one part looks just like every other part, barren, snowy. The only chance that they were going to have of of spotting and and getting down to the right place was this newfangled technology called the Eureka Rebecca uh, beacon, uh, where the grouse team would have uh, be sending out this signal and there would be a a receiver in the plane, and they would zero in on on the drop site. Well, this technology did not work, so they began circling. The wings of the gliders uh, began to ice up. The wings of the Halifax planes began to ice up. Eventually, uh, one crashed into a mountain. The tow rope broke on another one of them, and these gliders were pitching down, you know, without engines uh, to... uh, to keep them afloat straight into mountains. Operation Freshman is a is a tragedy of this war. And to imagine being these soldiers who had no idea what heavy water was, but they, you know, stood forward in line and said, I will go, um, is is remarkable. What they faced and what they endured, the ones who actually survived the crash and were captured by the Germans, um, is again a, a tragedy. And it was a uh, only a few that a very few that survived and did the germans get anything useful from them uh, uh, you know about the british intentions or the allied intentions the majority of them did perish when the gliders crashed i mean again they're in a wooden coffin they're they're going uh, very fast into the side of the mountain uh, those who did survive many of them were wounded the germans um, captured them some of them were tortured some over the course of a day some over the course of of over a month from what I found from the German records, the Germans were able to, through interrogation, through torture, through whatever means, uh, piece together a very detailed outline of exactly what Operation Freshman was about, how they planned on entering Vermuk, and what their intentions were. I mean, did they have any re- reaction to that? Did they think that was it? Or did they, uh, you know, try to lock down the whole area? Or You know, the Germans suspected that the Allies wanted to hit the plant. Um, so they had already reinforced security a great deal. They had put mines around the hillsides. They had put up barbed wire fences. They had increased the guard. They had put up spotlights. Once Operation Freshman ended and it was discovered, they reinforced that security even more. And the, the lead general of German forces in Norway came to the plant made it very clear to the guard force that this was an important site and they needed to be keenly ready for any second attempt, which made it even more difficult for the subsequent team, Operation uh, Gunnerside. So who were Gunnerside and what was their plan? This is sort of take two, isn't it? A second attempt. Immediately after Operation Freshman ended in disaster, and and by immediately I mean within a day, uh, Live Schoenstatt, and a, an individual named uh, Colonel Wilson, who was Tronstadt's counterpart at SOE, put forward the idea, which they had had originally, of a small force of Norwegians to attack Vermuk. They assembled this team uh, under an individual named Joachim Ronenberg, 
who was a young Norwegian soldier. He was 23 years old, I, I believe, at the time. And he selected a, a team of, of five others to train very much on the same equipment that these uh, English sappers, uh, British sappers, trained on and to uh, parachute into Norway and attack the plant uh, with original grouse members who were already on the ground. Yes, and gra- gra- <laughs> this is where we must get confused, where grouse then becomes sparrow. Yes, grouse, grouse becomes swallow. Oh, swallow. Uh, they changed, they, they yeah. changed the, co- they changed the code name um, for security reasons. Yes, and, and, and swallow or grouse was, was very excited to be part of this now because originally they were intended only to guide the royal engineers to the site they were not to uh, be part of the operation itself once freshmen ended in disaster they had survived for quite a long time waiting for this second operation surviving in a place where the only thing they have to eat is the reindeer that they hunt i think one of the parts of this story that i love the most is it's the Germans were the enemy, but for a great deal uh, of this story, it's it's nature, it's the the winter, and the ability of these uh, commandos to survive that made this mission a success. And these grouse soldiers needed to survive for for months in a in a cabin in the middle of nowhere, essentially, awaiting the arrival of gunner side team. Uh, yeah, it's just is a recurring factor, isn't it? The weather it, 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 it helps them and uh, also is against them throughout the whole thing, and it's hugely extreme. <laughs> the the vida, uh, as it was called, I mean, the, the gusts of winds are, are are hurricane intensity. They could literally throw a man off his off his feet. Uh, the blizzards were constant. The lack of food was a constant concern. Uh, it was a very, very tough, tough, tough place to survive, uh, and these guys did it essentially alone. The uh, and these are Norwegian teams that they're dropping back in, and are they all predominantly local to that area, or at least uh, they have a lot of uh, cold weather experience, don't they? These are all. So the original grouse team, uh, the original grouse team was assembled of. of the leader was from the area, uh, Jean Anton Paulson. Three of the four were were local boys. They knew the terrain. They knew the area. They knew locals. They knew it like the back of their hand. They'd grown up there. Uh, the gunner side team was comprised of of six men who were not from the area. The only the second in command was from a, a nearby uh, part of town, as it were, New uh, Hauklid. Uh, but all the others were from other parts of Norway. That said, uh, they were all uh, expert cross-country skiers. They all uh, had been training in Scotland, some for, for several years, and they were, were tough, hardened individuals who were accustomed to surviving outside. So they're now sending in six men to do the job that they had with uh, you know, three fully laden gliders of uh, sappers. So what was the plan for the you know for the for this smaller team? The the six men of Gunner's side would join with the the four men of Grouse and together they would split up they would ski into the area and then they decided okay so what's the best way to to reach the plant? We could cross the single lane suspension bridge. That's an option, although it's heavily guarded. They could come down from the mountains, but that was heavily mined and also guarded. Or they could climb down into the valley, the, the ravine, and, and climb up in the middle of the night this uh, points sheer cliffside to reach the railway line that they could then follow into the plant. After long deliberation uh, in a cabin, Ronenberg and, and the others decided that the climb was the best way to reach the plant uh, without being spotted. It, it's sort of Hobson's choice, isn't it, really? They're all awful uh, ways to enter the plant, but that's kind of the lesser of any any of the evils. There was long deliberation on how do we do this? And Live Tronstadt in, in England had gone over this with the team as well. His suggestion was the climb to go by the railway line. But it's a very different thing to be in, in London saying you should do this versus being in the area in the middle of the winter time 
knowing that it's it's uh, seldom wide out. And so we're going to have to do this climb at, at night. And it's going to be icy and uh, it's going to be very dark. And how are we going to do it? When you read it in the book, and it's it's like reading a James plot of James Bond <laughs> uh, when they get into the plant. So I wonder if you could quickly you know, t- take us through actually what they did when they got in the plant. What happened to them? So it's it's now a nine man team. Um, one of the one of the individuals is is actually two of them in a hut uh, again in in the Vita awaiting word so they could radio it to London. So it's a it's a nine man team that's coming down the railway line. They wait for the change of guard after midnight. They wait for for these guards to be tired and to be ready to to go back to their barracks, and they snap open the the lock covering the gate and five of the men go in and reach positions as a, as a covering party. Uh, they cover the bridge, they cover the pipelines coming down into the plant and, and they cover the barracks. And then two, two man teams go to uh, infiltrate the plant and set explosives to, uh, to get rid of it. They do this as, as backup. They have two teams in case one of them uh, can't reach it. And Ronenberg, at the very start of the mission, said, you know, one of us has to do it. Um, one of us has to touch to reach it. Even if it's only one man, we have to do it. They reach the plant, they, they get it, and they find that the door that they thought would be opened is, is locked. But the thing is, thanks to Life Tronstadt, they had exceptional intelligence on this plant. They knew how many steps uh, went down to the basement. They knew what kind of locks were on the doors. They knew alternate entry points. They knew where the guards were, when the guards were there. So they were able to adjust on the fly. They, they knew that there was a tunnel, a small little tunnel, that had cables and, and pipes that was in the wall of the exterior of the building that they could climb up into and then find their way inside the plant. So this is what two of the men uh, did, uh, Ronenberg and his uh, counterpart. They entered the plant. There was a Norwegian guard in the heavy water, heavy concentration area. They secured him and then started uh, setting the explosives. And the thing is, you know, once they were inside the plant, the Germans never thought that anyone could ever possibly reach inside the plant. So once they were in, it was fairly unguarded. I mean, there were Norwegian watchmen, but other than that, uh, the Germans never suspected that someone could get inside the plant. So everything was, was about securing the entry. And once they were inside, they were free to essentially do what they needed to. And how was the German reaction, reaction to the explosion once it went off? Well, the explosion was fairly muffled. So uh, Newt Hauklid and, and Paulsen were, were covering the barracks, uh, awaiting for the rush of soldiers to come out once the explosion was heard. What they heard was something far less than they expected. It was a it was a muffled explosion that could have been some falling snow. What ended up happening is one guard came out and they uh, and was suspicious about what the noise was, but it was not intense enough to cause a raise of alarm yet. So this gave the the gunner side grouse team time to run down the railway line before the alarm bells and the sirens uh, went off you, you, you kind of have this idea of uh, you know, you're blowing the plant and uh, you know the windows going and licks of flame blowing out but as you said everything in the plant that's of any worth will be in the in the deep dark basement so there really won't be anything more than a, a muffled thud exactly <laughs> and the, the, the muffled th- thud however was supremely effective in destroying the the heavy concentration plant. There were 18 cells that were bringing the heavy water to 99.5% purity. All of those were destroyed. All the heavy water that was inside them was drained down into the drains and entered the water that, that was flowing through the valley. And this set back heavy water production for uh, roughly nine months to a year. And uh, this was, was very important for uh, delaying the, the German uh, atomic research program. They're now on the run, uh, you know, proje- heading, heading you know, trying to get out as fast as possible. What was the German response over the coming few days and weeks? Well, so now they're on the run, right? So they're, they're, they're hurling themselves down this, uh, this cliffside 
Um, they know there's uh, 200, 300 soldiers uh, in the nearby town. Um, they need to get into the Vita, into the plateau as soon as they possibly can because they know there's going to be a massive manhunt. Fortunately, again, the weather uh, worsened and allowed them to, to get into the mountains and essentially shut down any manhunt for several days. And then once they were able to get that little bit of breathing room, it became, again, this, uh, this situation where it wasn't really the Germans that were the problem. It was surviving the Vita uh, and surviving, a uh, for, for five of them, a 250-mile journey to the Swedish border. And for the others, uh, surviving those who wanted to stay behind and continue uh, underground activity, and they, they needed to both survive the Norwegian winter as well as the, the launch of an even more massive manhunt uh, in the subsequent weeks. Yeah, which presumably the weather hampers everybody. And at least the guys are, uh, I say, the, the Norwegians. So that's that's the one thing they have in their favor probably over the Germans who are trying to find them. Absolutely. And and the thing is, is that the Vita was, was such a place that the Germans did not want to enter it. And when they invaded, they you know, 1940, they made every effort not to have to penetrate it. But suddenly they, they understand that these saboteurs, the resistance is, is using the Vita's impenetrability to uh, hide. And so they assemble a force of between six to 10,000 men to begin uh, searching it. The fact of the matter is that they're never going to find these guys. I mean, I've stayed in some of these uh, winter huts on the Vita, and they get covered with snow, and, and it's impossible to find. It's just impossible, and particularly for someone who, who knows it like the back of their hand. Uh, and the Germans, even the good Austrian ski troops, aren't going to do it. But in nine months, they get the plant running again. And you know, at the start, we, we have our checklist of what... what what they thought was you know their favorite options and at the bottom of that list of their favorite options was bombing and now the allies find themselves they've gone through their checklist and they've got the plant is now working again so they they try bombing yes i mean here's here are the facts i mean the the allies were advancing in their atomic research uh in their construction of the bomb they knew it was possible they knew that with with the right resources, they could have it done in, in, a, in a year to 18 months. And they knew that if Hitler was able to obtain the same, that he would absolutely use it. And so in their eyes, every effort needed to be made. Any risk was too much risk to bear. Vermook is, is re, begins production again within five months, but really in earnest, as you said, nine months the Allies say, okay, we need to do something again. Uh, several of the individuals who were part of the, the gunner side operation are still on the ground. They're providing intelligence about what's happening at the plant. They're saying that reproduction is up again. Not only is it up again, but they've increased it, and they've started two other heavy water plants uh, that uh, Norse Kidro owns, and they're, they're making every effort to create heavy water, to no doubt build a bomb, to destroy London, New York, whatever. And so they need to do something. And they decide, well, we can't send another team in to hit the plant. They now expect that. And so we need to bomb it. We need to try to bomb it from there. And so they send in the, the American 8th Air Force with hundreds of bombers dropping just an enormous payload onto uh, Vermook, the town of Rukon, uh, and the surrounding hillsides. What damage does it do to the factory? Very little. So the expectation that, that Life Tronstadt had all throughout, it's going to be very difficult to hit this plant. Even if you do hit this plant, you're not going to reach the most critical part of it. And that was the case. Uh, they sheared off a part of the top floor. They blew out the pipelines. They destroyed buildings in Rukon. A number of, of civilians uh, were killed, but the fact of the matter is uh, it would be a pretty easy job for the Germans to salvage all, all the damage and, and to get things going again pretty quickly. That said, um, the Germans saw this American or witnessed this American air raid, which was awesome in its sight, and decided the Allies just aren't going to give up. 
you know, they're just going to keep hitting this plant month after month until it's gone. And so we need a plan B. And the plan B in the early parts of, of 1944 is we're going to move the plant. We're going to disassemble the equipment. We're going to take all the heavy water that's been in these thousands of cells that are part of this process. We're going to secure it in drums and we're going to bring it by rail line and then ship to Germany and we're going to reconstruct a, a plant there. And that's what happens in, in February of 1944. This, uh, this transport of the heavy water and, and subsequently the heavy water equipment begins. And once again, the Allies say, well, we can't have that happen. Presumably they have intel exactly what's happening at this point as well. The intelligence is just remarkable. The Norwegians, um, thanks to an individual named Einar Schinnerland, who had been dropped into the area in April of 1942. He was a local boy. He actually, his family ran the dam that provided the, the, the water to the hydroelectric plant that was at Vermuk. He was an engineer at Vermuk, and he went to England, said, I want to spy for you guys. I want to do whatever I can. They dropped him in in April of 1942, and he was the inside man for going on two and a half years. He was the one providing uh, information on what's happening, where is the security, how much production is increasing. He was a, a absolute hero <laughs> in, in every sense of the word. His best friends, his family, all were persecuted uh, because of him, but he kept going, kept providing intelligence, and he is was one of the unsung heroes in this operation because he wasn't part of Gunner's side. He wasn't in on going into the plant. He was never on any of the, the missions, but that he was the one supplying the intelligence. And without him, uh, without his sacrifice, none of this would have happened. It, thanks to Schinnerland, the Allies knew and Life Transat knew in London exactly when the transport was happening, bringing the equipment, the remaining heavy water, uh, where it was going, and what the security would be. And again, this was instrumental in the operation that followed. Uh, this was the bit I found absolutely incredible. You know, what, where did they, they decide that, that the weak link in the uh, transport plans were? So, so you have this plant, right? And it's on this cliffside and there's a railway line. And so Schinnerlin with uh, Newt Haukelid, who was the sort of the guy in charge now uh, of any operations, they hash over what to do. And there's a railway line. They think, well, we could blow up the railway line, but the cars on it would pitch into the valley, but the heavy water wouldn't be destroyed. We could try to attack the ship as it leaves port, but that's outside of our area of, of concern. And they decide that they're the one spot where the heavy water uh, and the transport is most vulnerable is the ferry, the rail ferry that goes uh, across a huge lake. If they attack the boat, they would be able to stop it. If they sink the boat, the heavy water would be irrecoverable at the bottom of uh, Lake Tinso. The pl their plan essentially was once the heavy water is on board to, to blow the boat. And the problem with blowing the boat is it's not just a rail ferry, it's a passenger ferry. And so they cable London, or they don't cable, they wireless uh, radio London, say this transport on, on the, the uh, Hydro ferry... Um, we'll be carrying the heavy water barrels. It will also be carrying passengers. Should we proceed? And they asked a couple of times, should we proceed? Uh, because it was a very hard thing for them to, to bear. Again, Schinnerlin was a local boy. These were Norwegians, innocent civilians, and they would have to go down with, with the ferry. And it was, uh, as you mentioned earlier, a Hobbesian choice. It ended up that they that London said this is imperative. The loss of lives is insignificant compared to what could potentially happen if the Germans obtain the bomb. Proceed. And so Newt Hauklid, all his commandos are gone now. Um, and so he's the last one. So he has to assemble some local boys to help him get onto the ferry in the middle of the night, set the explosives on a timer, and then uh, and then escape. And uh, how successful was the bomb? 
the bomb was uh, successful. I mean, the, the, uh, it went off uh, exactly on time. When the ferry reached the middle of the lake, its deepest point, and the, the ferry went down within minutes, the heavy water went down with it, uh, as did a, a number of passengers. You know, I, I spoke to Hakulut's family during my research, as well as Shilun's family. And, you know, the, the Hydro Ferry, that operation, which they had orders to execute, uh, obviously the reason for doing it was, was sound, uh, but it was something they carried with them for the rest of their lives. It's a miserable way to look at it. There's probably, if there's another big bombing raid, there would be probably more civilian casualties than uh, what went down with the ferry. That's absolutely the case. I mean, it was, again, the, the, the best of, of a number of bad options. I mean, they, the Allies had thought, well, we'll, we'll, dam- we'll blow up the dam. Yes, you can blow up the dam, but then the flood of water would, would rush down through the valley and wash away Rukan, which has thousands of residents. Uh, you could have another bombing attack. More civilians would die. You know, it was the best of many bad choices. And it was an extremely brave operation, too. I mean, again, uh, how could it, with just this ragtag group of guys uh, getting aboard this ferry, uh, securing these uh, explosives, and then getting out, and all these guards, it just was, you know, pretty remarkable. Uh, and that essentially put paid to the, you know, the, the heavy water, uh, you know, the, 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 the plants, as it were, that and, and the end of the war. I mean, this is February 44, the war with Germany finished in uh, uh, May. How close did the Germans realistic, realistically come to developing a bomb? Not close. I mean, realistically, the Germans did not come close. They, in June of, of 1942, while the, the Americans and the Allies were sort of beginning to launch into this uh, Manhattan Project, this massive hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to build bombs, uh, the Germans were simultaneously saying, this is costing a lot of money. We need to focus it on other things unless you can prove to us success. The fact of the matter is, by February of 1944, it was potentially, it was probably too late for them. But that doesn't make, I think there's two points to that. One, the Allies didn't know this. They didn't have perfect intelligence. So they did not know that the Germans weren't pursuing other avenues uh, beyond heavy water. They didn't know that a Manhattan-like project wasn't under works. So they were operating on the best information they had. I think the second point is the heavy water reactor that Kurt Diedner was was building. He was told, if you have success, if you can show us that you can create a self-sustaining reactor, which fundamentally relied on a lot of heavy water, which he was desperate to get, if you can build that reactor and show us that you can create this power, we will throw money at you until you're drowning in it. We will do what we're doing with the V1, V2 program, uh, the rocket program, which was an enormous research operation and and resources. You show us that you can create this, then let's do it. Uh, But he was never able to do that because he never had enough heavy water, and he never had enough heavy water because of what these uh, commandos and civilians uh, were doing to stop the Germans. Uh, it is just a fabulous story of just keeping at the same thing. And you would have thought, you know, going at it once, but not just once, you know, that it's time after time, tack after tack, you know, year after year that uh, they tenaciously keep at it. And uh, the story itself is just, it's no wonder you know, that the heroes of Telemark is, you know, is, is this sort of glossed over Hollywoodization of it. And if... <laughs> That almost seems you don't realize how much of that is actually kind of based on fact. Yeah, I mean, the the heroes of Telmark and the the Hollywood uh, stories and and even the sort of the quick stories of of the attacks on Vermuk are are remarkable in in their own right. I think what I loved about telling this story and what what I endeavored to do uh, in my research was really to to get into the lives of, of who these men were. Men like Leif Tronstadt, who's operating in London, has left his family behind in Norway. And he is the the brain behind uh, these operations. And what is he witnessing? What is he doing? What is the experience? What is his thoughts, fears, 
is is pretty pretty intense. Uh, similarly to Einar Schindeland, you know, here's a guy uh, who's living a double life for for years at a time. What is he experiencing? What is he seeing? And really bringing this story down to to the lives and through the eyes of the people who actually lived it, uh, rather than just these pretty remarkable events. Well, I think that you know, it's amazing what these people put themselves through, and I think what the book the, you know, the book sort of almost points out that the um, the opposition uh, it, it might have been the Germans, but again, it was the <laughs> the environment uh, was was as big a opposition or as big a threat uh, as the Germans and the missions themselves. Yes, I mean if you if you look at what was going on in the winter, let's say December of 1942, January of 1943, you you have this grouse team, right? These these four men uh living in a in a in a cabin uh with with frost and and you know, growing in on the inside it's so cold. And if they would not have been able to survive, um if they not would, would not have been able to uh find reindeer find their way through blizzards if they would have died. Gunnerside never would have happened. They never would have had someone on the ground uh, ready for them to arrive and supplied with the exact intelligence that they needed. And so really the story of the success of the sabotage of the atomic bomb program is really a story about survival mm. uh, in, in this uh, winter wilderness. Mm. And uh, it's pretty, pretty remarkable. Yeah. It is indeed, indeed remarkable. Uh, th- thank you for joining me. Neil's book, Winter Fortress, the epic mission to sabotage Hitler's atomic bomb is now available. Uh, there's a link on the website, www.podcast.com. It is an incredible story, parts of which may be familiar to some of you, but much will be unknown, I'm sure. Neil does a wonderful job in getting across that it wasn't just the Germans that the saboteurs had to fear, but it really was the environment. Um, that's Winter Fortress by Neil Bascom that's it for this episode don't forget you can find me on Facebook facebook.com forward slash ww2 podcast I do try to publish their posts which are related to the current episode so if you want to give me a like that would be champion I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening